What's up, duelists? Happy New Year. Your boy's back. I took a day off because I was, uh, celebrating. Or I was recovering from a celebration, basically. You know the vibes. I hope you all had a great, safe New Year's Eve. I hope you guys had fun. I hope you guys saw your family, saw the people who are important to you. A uh, few things before we get started on today's video. The RBET season is, it's gonna, it's gonna be announced shortly, but I didn't have it ready by... Uh, January 1st, which was, in hindsight, a little bit hopeful, uh, but yes, it should all be ready by January 15th to January 30th. There will be a major announcement sometime this month. Make sure you are st staying tuned. Make sure you guys are subscribed. Uh, the announcement will be impossible to miss when it happened if you are subscribed. So go ahead and hit the subscribe button, and uh, let's get right into things. So this is, uh, this is a video I've been wanting to make for a while. It's kind of like a year in review for Edison Format. Edison format is a deck builder's paradise. This is a format where people who like to brew, people who like to cook, get to really thrive. Now, there's one thing that I love about Yu-Gi-Oh! It's that you can put any card in your deck in some formats. Uh, in other formats, it becomes a little bit more difficult because there are only so many cards that are actually playable. But in Edison format, you get like literal vanillas that are playable all the way to cards like Future Fusion that are playable. So like you have a very wide range of cards that are usable, which means you can brew kind of infinitely in this format, even though it doesn't have the fullest range of uh, legal cards that have been printed for Yu-Gi-Oh! It does have the fullest range, in my opinion, of cards that you can actually use and be competitive with. So in this video, I'm going to be looking at the top five decks, in my opinion, it was really hard to narrow these down, but the top five decks, in my opinion, in 2023 that were the most creative and the most competitive all in one. Uh, I want to showcase these guys, these deck builders. They're they're really incredible. They're super inspiring to me personally. They they see the game through a lens that's like so so artistic and so unique and yet still so competitive and so competitively minded, which is it's really sick to get that sort of duality uh, in things. Couple of honorable mentions. I did want to shout out Michael Kelly's Flamvel Rescue Cat list, uh, an old or a new take on an old classic. Uh, Ghost Riders, Reckless Greed, Dragon Turbo, the Reckless Rider classic, you know the vibes, I wanted to shout that out, I wanted to shout out uh, a couple other ones, Jake XO, Best Yu-Gi-Oh! Player NAs, Gold Sark, Deep Sea Diva Zombie list, and I wanted to shout out Fraser Smith's Frog Hero deck list, I think these lists were like really good innovations from the last year, they, they took something that we already kind of knew, and then they like made them, they took them to the next level basically, but they didn't quite make the cut for my top five. All right, starting off number five, we got Trey Naldo's Gaia Rock deck list. Now this is the newest of the five in my um in my the list tier, tier list in my top five list. Uh, it got got second place recently at a Ghost Rare Stardust tournament, the the birthday bash tournament at Xanadu. Had over 70 players. I think I almost had 80 players. Uh, so a pretty decent size event. He think I think he went 9-0 into the finals, which is very impressive. Um, but this is a deck he's been playing, like, not only just at that tournament, but online as well for, for a, a long period of time. He's been testing it. The way the deck works is you use your rock monsters and your fiend monster to sort of open your opponent up, break through their openings. And then once you get them down to about, like, 4,000, 5,000 life points... You just try to slap a dark calling into play and close the game out immediately. The deck has a lot of really unique cards, cards that probably have never seen tournament play ever, like Release from Stone. The way this card works is as select one of your removed from play rock type monsters and special summon it. When its card is removed from the field, destroy that monster, you get the idea. But the point is, is you get to bring back a banished rock monster. How do you get your rock monsters banished? Well, dark calling does that for you. He told me personally that in the mid to late game, release from stone between Fossil Dyna and Kawaki Mero Guardian, release from stone basically becomes modal Solemn Strike or Vanity's Emptiness, which is pretty insane. And then on top of that, it does get to put a powerful monster into play. Sometimes it could even bring back Gaia Plate to help you go for a game. Uh, one of the sickest decks. Honestly, one of the coolest sort of deck designs. I really like it. Uh, Kaius, obviously one of the best cards in Edison format, one of the best generic removal cards. Doom Caliber and Kawaki Meru Guardian are very good going second. You'll notice a lot of these brews have sort of broken through that paradigm of Set Raiko. Some of them embrace it. I think this one embraces the paradigm of Set Raiko going first a little bit more than the other ones. But this deck uh, does rely on getting a Rock and a Fiend in the graveyard 
pretty quickly. So you do kind of want to have like a large number of millers. I think three hamster, three Ryko is a bit much for me personally. If I was going to play this deck, I would actually cut a super nimble mega hamster for like a cyber dragon. And then I'd probably side the second cyber dragon just because um, that's just like how I would approach this deck. I might even try something like snipe hunter in this deck just to um, high roll because I'm a, I'm a crazy little guy like that. But uh, there's there's something to be said for maxing out on the, the main paradigm of the format. Making sure your opponent, like whether or not uh, you can deal with that, like turn one set monster, what could it be? Um, that sort of thing. It, if your opponent can't deal with it, then it's good to have it. You know what I mean? So that's that's kind of the vibes, basically. Uh, yeah, five reanimation spells to bring back your guys. Three dark callings to slap a giant dark guy into play. This guy's insane. He destroys Raikou. Like he wins through Raikou, basically, because he stops the effect from activating. He wins through a lot of stuff. Uh, just actually such a sweet looking deck. Gigantes is another card that's seen very little tournament play despite being honestly pretty fucking strong. Another way to get your release from stone live. Special summon it by banishing one earth from your grave. And when it's destroyed by battle, you get a heavy storm. Pretty strong in a deck when you have no back row. You can really disincentivize your opponent from attacking you by putting one of these into play. Fossil Dyna can act as a regeki against decks like frogs when they set up double dupe frog against decks that set up multiple absolute zero or dandy tokens or titanial it's just one of the best cards at dealing with established boards that were special summoned it's incredibly strong at locking out entire strategies as well against frogs you summon one of these it's very difficult for them to actually play unless they have stratos junk synchron or rota or something like that so uh generally speaking just a, just a really powerful deck that utilizes a lot of cards that i think do very well into the meta Grammel, again, card solos value turbo. If you draw this, uh, you just swing. And if they have D-Prison, well, you have triple release from stone in return. So this card, it literally just, you summon this card and value turbo loses, which is, uh, that's crazy. And you get to play Sangin to search it as well. So having this guy be a built-in part of your engine and then being able to spam it, even in the worst case scenario where he gets deprisoned, is is very good. That's all I'll say. It's just very, very good. The sideboard, straightforward. Once again, I would try to get some Cyber Dragons in here. I feel like Machines might give this deck a little bit of a little bit of a problem, just because like Pitch Summon Fortress doesn't really care about Guardian, Doom Caliber, or Raikou. Uh, so like your real the only real out, out to that is Fossil Dyna. Uh, Kaius also kind of hurts going into Machina Fortress. So I would definitely try to have some cards for Machines. Um, but this is this is I think the first of many times we are going to see this deck. I think this deck is very good. I have played it a little bit. I'm going to be doing a video with it later this week. And I think it's definitely deserving of the fifth place slot. Shout out to Trainaldo for cooking on this one. Okay, number four. I honestly couldn't have a top five creative deck list without having Raunuk in it. This is Raunuk's Frog Rockets. He took this to a top eight finish at the, I believe, either the first or the second RBT of the season. This deck is like your standard frog deck, but I think it's better in a lot of ways. The main way is that it takes advantage of your opponent just trying to go for OTKs. Against frogs, they're usually very defense light. So your game plan is sandbag resources and then go for a big push. This deck, it kind of plays off of that whole like concept that whole strategy against frogs which is sandbag your resources and go for an otk because it has six ways to stop the battle phase completely in threatening roar and wabaku so if your opponent sees the dupe lock right they can't pressure you very actively and then between the three threatening roar and the three wabaku they can't pressure you hardly at all and then in the meantime while that's happening you're burning them either with lava golem or turbo rocket or turbo cannon which you can make with Turbo Rocket and Treeborn Frog, uh, just incrementally burning them every single turn, or just straight up burning them with Caius, Swap Frog, Bounce Loop, that sort of stuff. Unifrog, Direct Attacks, Flip Flop, keeping their board cleared, whatever. Flip Flop plus Lava Golem is a build your own Icarus attack, devastating combo. There's a lot of really cool synergies in this deck between the burn cards and the frog cards that I think is, it, at this moment, it's a little bit underexplored. I honestly expected a lot more people to see this list and play it throughout the year. The only people who did, uh, Jaina, I know went like 12-0 at a YCS with this deck, and um, uh, Homam Jamal, who also made top 8 at Moreno Valley with this deck. So like, two really powerful players uh, picked up the deck and just had immediate amazing results. And I think that like if more and more people were to play this deck, it would it would become a serious contender for like one of the top decks in the format. 
every time I play against frogs, I pretty much just hope it's not this version because this is like the scariest version to play against. This is the version that has the easiest time locking you out of the game, making it so that it's like inevitable if you go for the push, but if you go for the push, you get punished and lose all your resources because they just threatening roar and then they clear your board with enemy controller, creature swap, brain control, lava golem. They have a million different ways to deal with the board once it's resolved at net positive. So I think that this is like, definitely definitely one of the better frog decks to come out of the year um i think it's even better than frog hero in my opinion when i play against frog hero at least i feel like i have chances when i play against this deck i'm like do i have to side in dust tornado for like <laughs> you know what i mean it's like such a weird weird situation to be put into and then you get poked with unifrog until you lose your dust tornadoes and then they oh it's just it's just a nightmare this deck is really really difficult to play against and i think that that in in theory is not in theory, but like in practice is what makes it such a good and uh, unique deck. I've never seen anyone try to use Lava Golem with frogs before. It's it's really interesting, but it's really cool. It's kind of a modern approach to this deck, using Lava Golem to out your opponent's uh, monsters, as opposed to using something like, you know, Torrential Tribute or a, a Deep Prison or something like that, or whatever, you know what I mean? Whatever standard removal, Smashing Ground, you know, Soul Exchange even. Uh, and the sideboard in this, I love it. Very modern. Three of, of everything for all your matchups. You got three Vanities for the Frog matchup, three DD Crow for the Zombies, three Sirocco for the Black Wings and Vayu Turbo, three Book of Moon to deal with Vanities Fiend, that card's a bitch, and three Dust Tornado to deal with stuff like Mask of Restrict, which can shut this deck out. Um, overall, just, just a really awesome deck. Like, it gets to use a lot of underutilized cards, Turbo Rocket, Turbo Cannon, and the I think the three tournament successes of this deck alone have made turbo cannon a very expensive card so uh, lo a lot to be said about this deck i think that we should see more of this i could have put at least five of round x brews in here i could have put his garden frogs i could have put his um what was that other one the mausoleum frogs i could have put a, the guy just cooks decks for a living like he's just a professional chef he's a five-star michelin restaurant chef when it comes to making decks and um i could have put any one of those but i think that this one out of all of them is competitively the best uh i think this one is the least fragile it has the least holes and as a, it's had the most lasting success as well not only did roundock have success with this but the the stronger players who have picked it up afterward were able to have almost immediate success with it as well so a uh, really solid deck list i think if you're looking to pick something up that's a little bit unique if you're kind of like one of those burn guys you know what i'm saying if you're one of those burn guys this is this is the deck for you. This is a, one of the cooler ways to play Burn in Edison format. All right, third place. Third place. Ooh, speaking of third place, he got third place at Nats with Amaryllis Burn. Oh my gosh, and he recently won a PS5. This is Lil Man Yu-Gi-Oh's Amaryllis Burn deck. This is a take on a deck that a player later on this list uh, had innovated but uh, I think Lil Man Yu-Gi-Oh! really took it to the next level. He performed at the highest level of competition, got third at the biggest tournament this year, won a PS5 tournament later this year with it, uh, did exceptionally well. He earned his invite to RBET Rulers with this deck uh, and really put this deck on the map. I mean, he's, he's a large part of the reason why Amaryllis is such an expensive card. The card only has one printing and it's incredibly powerful in Edison format. It gives you this infinite resource loop, this sort of inevitability, this burn that slowly chips away at your opponent, you'll notice that a lot of these lists, they do a great job of, of threatening your opponent's life points, like making it so your opponent's life points is not a resource they can rely on, not something that they can just sit back and relax. They have to play defensively or they have to play, you know, maybe in a way that they don't want to play. And so um, a lot of these lists in the top five, they do a great job of attacking life as a resource. Whether that's getting an early titanial and hitting for 2800, this card's basically like Herald of Ultimateness in Edison format. I've said this a million times before, but so much targets in Edison format that Titanial is just basically an Omni Negate in a lot of situations. And it's an Omni Negate that is very easy to spam thanks to like Dandelion and Amaryllis in this deck specifically. Another thing that's really great about this deck is if you draw your Titanial, it's not entirely a brick because you do have trade in and you do have DDR and you have triple wind blast to get it in the graveyard. So you have a lot of ways to convert a drawn titanial and your lone fires can still get other titanials because you don't just play that one as opposed to those quick draw deck lists where you play one titanial you draw your titanial all of a sudden your lone fires are bad more or less in this deck lone fire is always a good card it always has something to good or something good to get and even in the later game 
uh, you can use Lone Fire to get Lord Poison to get back one of your Titanials if you've already used all three. So Lone Fire Blossom just probably at its best or second best in this deck list. Um, I think that the the results of this deck say enough alone. I mean, the most recent tournament, the PS5 tournament, uh, first and second place were both playing this deck. Like this is this is I think one of the best decks in in the current metagame at the very least, uh, if not one of the one of the coolest decks to see like sort of have its big resurgence. One big change from the initial lists that were kind of floating around in 2022 was getting rid of the volcanic counters. They've been moved to the side in this list. This is the list from Nats, but I believe uh, people have moved away from playing them entirely. They just have been inconsistent, too easy to play around. People kind of understand how they work now. And so uh, moving away from Volcanic Counter in general has been like the biggest change this year. And I think as a result, it's made this deck very consistent. One of the more recent lists that I played against was playing Debris Dragons in the main. And I found that to be incredibly terrifying because they can make Black Rose Dragon and switch your monster to attack and deal insane amounts of damage and then just bring back an Amaryllis and be like, well, if you attack me, you die. And if you don't attack me, you die. So they put you in a lot of checkmate situations. I do like the Debris Dragon initiative uh, to add it add that to this deck i think there are a couple other cards that could go into this list that this is probably not the most up-to-date list of amaryllis but i think that this is this is the list that had the biggest success this year and so it's the one i've got pulled up for the video uh mark of the rose once again one of the best cards in edison format hidden armory plus ddr uh to get mark of the rose is it's just a really really unique way to i don't know just steal steal stuff or special summon or go Go over the top. I mean, having a tutorable snatch steal is that's ridiculous. Like that is that is on a power level that you don't see in Edison format. Snatch steal is banned. A lot of the other cards that are of comparable power level, change of heart, banned. You know what I mean? Like uh, Mark of the Rose is just it's like the next best thing. It's even better than brain control, in my opinion, in a lot of cases. <laughs> uh, straight up, uh, the reason I think that is because not only can you tutor it, but um, you can you can. Uh, what was it? What was it? What was it? What was it? There's a there's a reason it's better. You can book the monster, you keep it, whatever. There's a lot of there's a lot of reasons why Mark of the Rose is better. It's so much better. In fact, the second place list from that PS5 tournament that happened recently uh, was not even playing Brain Control. They said, "I don't even need Brain Control. I have Mark of the Rose. It's better." So that's uh, that's saying something to be cutting one of the best spell cards in the format because you have something better. Uh, it speaks to the power level of this deck. I think this deck is very strong, especially once it gets going. It's very difficult to deal with um and it's it's changed the way people build their decks too which is usually the sign of a good deck uh at the beginning of the year people would maybe have a couple cards for graveyard hate nowadays people have like five to seven cards for graveyard hate just to be able to deal with uh the speed at which this deck go gets going and the advantage it gets from having an active graveyard that being said, even when you do hate out the graveyard on this deck, even when you do banish their plant monsters, you got to be careful that DDR because that can bring back Titanial. You can pitch a dandy, bring back Titanial, and instantly be cooking. So uh, you definitely, even the cards that are good against this deck are not, they're not always good. So uh, definitely, definitely a strong deck list. I think it's fitting to put Lil Man Yu-Gi-Oh's build at third place because that's what he placed at Nats Kappa. Uh, but I'm excited to see what happens with Amaryllis in 2024. Second place. Once again, you really can't have a top five most innovative creative deck building list without having Carpath on it. In second place, I have Carpath's Chaos Fairies. At the beginning of the year, Carpath won Deck Devastators with this exact list. And then at the end of the year, he topped RBT Rulers with this exact list. Being the only player to pilot fairies at RBT Rulers and taking it all the way to the top is is very impressive i'm really impressed with car pass play but even more so i'm impressed with his deck building his unique perspective on the game the way he understands how certain cards work and not only how they work in a vacuum but how they work in a competitive uh interactive sense as well the way he was able to perceive that royal decree plus fader caius would be a great way to mix up his opponents from the standard defense of like you know mirror force deep prison bottomless that sort of stuff foregoing that entirely and just having royal decree as like a way to shut out their stuff and then having defense that wasn't reliant on uh being a purple card or being set in play like herald of orange gore's trag battle fader that sort of thing in the sideboard he's got dd crows as well so like uh, an insane amount of hand traps with royal decree one of the one of the cooler ways to build this deck i think uh a lot of differences from the initial lists that i had kind of 
created in 2021 and that won RBT Rulers in... Is it 2022? 2022? I don't remember. I think it was 2022, but there are some some carryovers from that. You know, you got the one mind control, the one Cyber Valley, uh, which was an innovation that I had worked on and sent to ProStorm before he won his RBT rulers. You can tutor the Cyber Valley off of any one of your recruiters, and you can convert your mind control that way. Mind control also improves that going second paradigm into hamster or Ryko. If you mind control a hamster, you can summon your one Ryko from your deck. Um, which is just really nice. It just gives you that, that extra way to search for, for that good boy. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so a really, really unique way to, to attack the turn one paradigm with mind control. Dimensional Alchemist, one of the best cards at looping resources. Uh, honestly, I think Sky Scourge and Rise is a bit of a meme, but Carpath seems to swear by it, and he's had a ridiculous amount of success with the card. I mean, worst case scenario, you can pitch it to Herald, but it's... It's an interesting card for sure. It's a little bit difficult to get live. The effect is definitely powerful. I mean, it's the same as Chaos Sorcerer, but slightly stronger uh, and slightly more difficult to summon. But it is it is a powerful effect. I mean, Chaos Sorcerer is a really good card. It's limited to one for a reason. So uh, definitely something you can't sleep on when building a Chaos Fairy deck of your own or when just copying the list just uh, to take into consideration when, when Sky Scourge and Rise is going to be sided out and whatnot like maybe you maybe you want to keep it in because it's so it's so based you know what i'm saying i think it speaks to carpath's deck building as well that he includes based cards like sky scourge and rise and then still has an incredible amount of success the sideboard very interesting triple electric virus that's to deal with uh basically dragons there's this card called quacky mara drago that locks this entire deck out makes it impossible to play so you gotta have maximum outs for that post board you're gonna have the triple electric virus double book or triple book of moon because you have one in the main as well so you have at least six ways to handle the Kwaki Mara Drago, as well as Brain Control and Mind Control, uh, which do clear the Drago as well, because you can choose not to reveal in the end phase and just have it die of natural causes. So a lot of ways to deal with the Drago. That card definitely hurts this deck, but this deck plays, honestly, a lot of the best cards in Edison format. Honest, another hand trap, which I totally forgot about. Nine hand traps, actually. Uh, Herald of Orange Light are two of the best cards in Edison format, bar none. Archler Christia is probably the best boss monster in edison format i don't think it gets much better than christia i think it's like it's like really close between christia and dark armed i think dark arms obviously more generic easier to summon but christia is more powerful and prevents your opponent from coming back into the game and can single-handedly win games on its own even when dropped when your opponent's at 8,000 life points it's very difficult to come back from uh christia hitting the field because it just keeps coming back every single turn it's so freaking good and Carpath absolutely cooked with this list. Uh, very proud of him, honestly, as a deck builder. He's he's just he's killing the game. Check him out on YouTube. Uh, also check out I think uh, Lil Man Yu Gi Oh also has a YouTube channel. Check him out if you want to get more Amaryllis resources. Just a little bit of a callback to number three there. And then number one, um, I think is the the most innovative, the most creative, the most powerful deck to come from the last year. I think this is the deck that like. I think about when I think about like damn someone really cracked it uh, and that's gonna be Zabo's instant zombies this deck is this deck is so sick uh, I've been playing it a lot recently offline of course it's been a deck I've been playing in paper and let me tell you this deck does not draw bad hands straight up uh, this deck is just 40 good cards you don't draw bad hands with this deck it is like it is just so consistent. It is it is straight up 40 good cards. <laughs> like, that's insane to say that there's like... It is almost impossible to brick with this deck. It is has such a high power level. It has OTK hands. It has speed. It does amazing going second. It does amazing going first. It threatens all the top decks. It has good matchups against Vayu. It has good matchups against Heroes. It has good matchups against Black Wings. It has good matchups against Quick Draw, better than the other zombie decks do, I think, because uh, of the ease of access to um, going second Caius on turn one. Um, it's just, and Triple Book of Life, of course, uh, makes it insane versus Frogs because you have that high level of graveyard hate to keep that Treeborn out of the graveyard. Uh, this is just this is just one of the one of the sickest decks. I mean, a lot of people worked on this deck, not just Zabo. Uh, Kraus, Bluff Knock, uh, a lot of people, a lot of people worked on it, but I think this list from top four of RBET rulers 
is honestly the pinnacle of deck building. Triple Pyramid Turtle, so you can swing into those turn one Rikos and guarantee your Book of Life will be live. You can banish their value, whatever they mill off Ryko, and bring back that turtle, and then you immediately have the initiative. Pyramid Turtle is insane versus Black Wings. They have difficulty swinging through this card. Effectively, they attack your Pyramid Turtle, you float into Goblin Zombie, you sack for Caius, and all of a sudden you're up plus two uh, against Black Wings. Just, just killing it. Just killing it. Trap Stun. One of the most underrated cards in this format, and I think it's finally found a home here in this deck. Um, it's just really important for shutting off big pieces of back row. Before you either go for an OTK combo with Dark Armed, or you can go for Instant Fusion plus Krebins or Instant Fusion plus Plague into Black Rose Dragon to destroy entire boards. Uh, once you've done that, you can bring back the premium Instant Fusion target, Reaper on the Nightmare, with Book of Life, uh, Mizuki, or Foolish Burial to send Mizuki. Um, to, to, to poke at your opponent's hand. So you can blow up the board very easily and then take their last few cards with Reaper on the Nightmare. This deck just plays Yu-Gi-Oh! on the best axis. It feels the best to play. I feel like it's one of the best Dark Arm Dragon decks. You have an incredible amount of Grave Control, not just with Book of Life and Call of the Haunted, Mizuki, Zombie Master, whatever, but also with like weird cards you wouldn't expect, like Psychic Life Transfer, Banishing Krebins, so that you have three darks so you can summon dark arm dragon there's just there's just so many pieces to this puzzle and they all fit together so perfectly this has been by far my favorite deck to come out of 2023 i think that this is going to be like definitely a contender for one of the best decks in 2024 definitely a deck to beat in 2024 it had a lot of tournament success towards the second half of 2023 and I expect to see a lot more of this deck. I mean, this is a just the most natural fit for Instant Fusion. And Instant Fusion is an incredibly powerful card. Like, if you've played Yu-Gi-Oh! for, for any duration of time, you, you understand. I mean, Instant Fusion is limited to one nowadays. It's just it's just very powerful to get a Synchro. Or not a Synchro, sorry. A Fusion. It's in the fucking name. I don't know. It's very powerful to get a card like Reaper on the Nightmare for just 1,000 life points. And it doesn't even cost you a normal summon. doesn't cost you any card advantage. It's just one for one straight up. Get one of the strongest monsters. Like if, if you could normal summon instant or if you could normal summon Reaper on the Nightmare, like that'd be really good. But this doesn't even normal summon, it special summons it. So uh yeah, really, really powerful card. It does have that drawback where it cannot attack, but in this deck, it doesn't really matter. You're just sacrificing it for Caius, using it as a synchro material, and then bringing it back later to rip cards out of their hand for free. The sideboard is perfect. Once again, you've got that Grand Mole to defeat one of the most popular decks in the format. Vayu Turbo, it also helps you against all the other Ryko Synchro decks, helps you against Zombies in the Mirror Match, uh, just a very strong card. You get to play all the best cards, but one of the nice things about this deck in particular is you don't have to rely on the Reactive Dimensional Prison or the Bottomless Trap Hole, which is often bad going second. You can use Compulsory Evacuation Device, which is incredibly versatile, is much more versatile, because... Even when you return a monster to the hand in this deck, you can take it out of the hand with Spirit Reaper or Reaper on the Nightmare very, very easily. So oftentimes, you turn Compulsory Evacuation Device, instead of a minus one, you turn it into a net neutral, destroy anything, uh, and then obviously this card interacts very well versus Synchro Monsters, Set Monsters, Boss Monsters like Christia that are in your way of going for your OTKs. Um, yeah, it's just really nice that this deck doesn't have to play these sort of I don't want to say narrow removal spells because they're obviously not super narrow, but they are a little more situational than compulsory evacuation device. And I think that that's that's just another piece of like this this like I said this huge puzzle that makes this deck so good. The deck has a great dragon turbo matchup because of the way it attacks the hand. If they brick for any reason at any point, even turn one, you can instant fusion normal summon or special summon one of your two star tuners and make x saber or bellum and immediately yada lock them out of the game so you don't give dragon turbo that opportunity to set up against you you don't give them that opportunity to ever get going you just immediately win the game the second they break which is crazy <laughs> that's just really really powerful being able to attack the hand is something that very few decks can do proactively in edison format and just in general in Yu-Gi-Oh's history, and this deck does a great job of doing that. So, uh, yeah, I think that's going to round out my top five. I mean, there were so many. There were so many lists, like BK Kids Club Gemini list. I know a lot of people were probably expecting that to be on here. It didn't have quite the tournament success I think it needed in order to make the top five of my both 
competitive and creative deck lists from 2023. Oh my gosh, there were just so many. There were so many Fitz Dragons. Um, there was, you know, Rob's adaptation of that deck. There were the, you know, like Vayu Norlaris decks that had some success here and there. But I think that moving forward, I think these five deck lists, the Chaos Fairies, the uh, Instant Zombies, the Amaryllis, style decks amaryllis plants the frog burn and the rock style uh evil hero dark gaia beatdown decks are going to be the mo most consistent competitive creative new decks that came from uh 2023 in any case if you have any ideas for 2024 let me know in the comments below thank you guys for tuning in thank you guys for an amazing year once again rbet uh announcements big rbet announcements are coming either the middle of this month or at the end of this month um, t between the middle and the end of this month, they are coming. I am working on that day and night to make sure you guys uh, have an amazing tournament season for Edison, and I'll see you guys in the next vid. Peace.